So let's get started. I'm Matos, I'm the Marketing Manager of Vision Mobile, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, this webinar is based on our newly launched M2M ecosystem paper, which uh, you can download for free at visionmobile.com slash M2M. In the webinar, we'll explain why ecosystems are the winning recipe to create growth, capture value, and reap a decisive competitive advantage in the digital era. We'll also go deeper into how telcos can open the market for today's non-consumers, as well as the role developers will play in this. So uh, before we get started in earnest, uh, let's do some housekeeping. The length of the webinar is around 40 to 45 minutes, and the recording will be made available uh, later this week. The agenda uh, is a short intro about Vision Mobile, uh, as well as uh, presenting today's speaker. Then the main webinar uh, by uh, the M2M ecosystem recipe paper author, uh, Stin Schuermans, uh, which should take around uh, half an hour. And in the last uh, 10 or so minutes, we'll have a Q&A session. So uh, you can ask questions in the chat window and uh, we'll be replying to uh, some uh, a selection of your questions. Uh, after the webinar or during the webinar, you can contact me at matos at visionmobile.com with any questions you may have. So a few short words on Vision Mobile. We are a mobile industry analyst uh, firm specializing in ecosystems. Uh, most of you will be familiar with our developer economics research series, uh, but today we're focusing on the second flagship product, uh, which is mobile innovation economics. So mobile innovation economics is a set of workshops helping companies understand, survive, and leverage software disruption. For the full range of reports and workshops, uh, you can visit our website at uh, visionmobile.com slash strategy. Our uh, clients include some of the uh, largest names in the mobile industry. Uh, we've worked with uh, many uh, well-known brands. You can see in this slide some tier one operators like at and Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom and Verizon, large handset OEMs like Nokia and Blackberry. Uh, chipset vendors like Qualcomm and Intel, as well as uh, software players like Mozilla and Microsoft. So uh, let's talk about our uh, presenter today. Uh, our speaker is, uh, like I said, Stain Schuermans. Uh, Stain leads the M2M research within Vision Mobile and is the author of the M2M ecosystem recipe our latest paper that was released uh, last week and is the subject of today's session. So uh, Stain, in his role as a senior business analyst at Vision Mobile, focuses on applying modern ecosystem economics theory to the mobile industry, exploring uh, the business model of the major players in mobile, as well as uh, platform strategy and innovation processes. So with this, I give the word to Stain. Thank you, Matos. Okay, let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think that a perfect storm is brewing in the Internet of Things. Uh, so M2M, machine to machine, uh, Internet of Things, in short, network devices, all different names for the same thing, are very high on the agenda of every major operator today, and many more companies beside that, and rightly so. But we believe that in today's uh, Internet of Things market has inefficiencies built into it that limit the growth of this market. We also see many technology trends in hardware, in software, and in funding that put the possibility of disruption on the horizon. So it's becoming easier and easier to innovate. And as a result of that, already a lot uh, of players, both in the amount of players and in their diversity, are, are entering the game uh, and are increasing the competition among them. So our statement is that if you want to emerge a winner in the M2M market, the time to act is now. And you don't just need to act, you need to act smart as well. 
we think that the, the ecosystem approach will be the winning recipe to win in this market. Um, M2M offers telcos the opportunity to build their own ecosystem and to reap the first mover advantages that they might not have had before. So the principles that we will talk about today have a broader relevance than just uh, telcos, uh, but you will notice that I will refer to them quite often. Uh, in this specific webinar, in the paper uh, we wrote, we took telcos as a, as a case study. But the principles are more broadly applicable. So I've made this bold statement that um, ecosystem thinking and ecosystem economics will be the winning recipe. So in order to explain why we think that, I need to take you back in time a little bit uh, to 2008, to the onset of the smartphone revolution. At that time, very experienced and very knowledgeable industry insiders, uh, including Vision Mobile uh, ourselves, were describing the smartphone market and the app economy as a broken business. After years of attempts by telcos and handset makers to get uh, this market off the ground by partnerships and by distribution deals and by designing new devices. So one observer, and not the least one at the time, was Mike Mace. He wrote a blog post in 2008, and he basically wrote an obituary for apps. He said, rest in peace, mobile applications. And he started off his blog post with this quote, the business of making native apps for mobile devices is dying. It's crushed by a fragmented market and by restrictive business practices. So that's quite a hefty uh, statement to make at that time. He describes uh, why uh, or what are these restrictive business practices. I mean, this was a costly uh, certification process to get your app on a device or distributed through a telco. There was a very high fragmentation of the market and distribution channels were either for applications were either missing or unaffordable. So some telcos in particular were roaming off up to 90% of the revenue of, uh, of app developers, taking it uh, for themselves. Apps at that time had become nearly commercially unviable. Uh, Mike Mace uh, ends his blog post by saying it's like they don't want any apps at all. So apps were dying in 2008. But that's not exactly what happened, is it? At that moment in history, two new players entered the market, Apple with the iPhone and the iOS uh, uh, operating system, and a little bit later in 2008, Google with, uh, with Android. So those two created a new mobile computing market using ecosystem economics. Instead of just building better devices in the same way with the same processes, uh, they connected users and developers together and they created a new market which was unaddressed by the leading telcos and smartphone makers of that time, like Nokia, like Motorola and, and others at the time. The result was not that apps were dying, but that there was an absolute explosion of apps. So in the last five years, about two million pieces of software were written, which is not at all a dying market. And as value shifted from characteristics of the devices themselves to apps and, e and application ecosystems, we saw an absolute explosion of smartphone sales as well, far beyond the original smartphone market, even uh, eating well into the mobile market as a whole and even in the computing market. So this, in five years' time, uh, was an incredible evolution and quite an achievement. This was not the first time that this happened either. We've seen over and over again in, in the history of business that established industries producing quite complex products get outsmarted by seemingly much simpler solutions. Uh, especially in the beginning of such solutions, they're considered just toys. However, these toys open up new markets driven by ecosystem economics. We've seen this with personal computers overtaking mini computers and mainframes in the 80s. We've seen it with digital photography uh, overtaking analog photography, with victims uh, such as uh, the giant uh, Kodak uh, uh, company. We've seen it again with smartphones and we've seen it in many different industries uh, over time. I put this question before you today. What if the M2M market today is exactly like the app economy was in 2008. It seems to me that M2M today shows similar frictions and inefficiencies as high fragmentation, a closed distribution system, and quite, you know, M2M is, is known for quite complex industrial products uh, designed for quite narrow vertical markets. So we think that because of that, because of the same patterns repeating themselves, it is similarly limited in its growth potential, at least at this moment in time. This might seem like a gloomy message, but I think it's actually quite hopeful because it means that we can apply the same proven ecosystem principles that 
created all those other markets to unlock the full potential of the M2M -M market right now. And what's more, we believe that ecosystems, uh, M2M -M ecosystems can be designed to put pressured companies like telcos once more in the lead, creating profitable growth for them, uh, not just growth but profits as well, and giving them a decisive competitive advantage. So in this webinar, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about what is an ecosystem. Ecosystem is a quite overused buzzword, uh, but we use it with a pretty specific meaning, which we will explain. We'll have a look at what are the ingredients of such an ecosystem, uh, and an Internet of Things ecosystem in particular. And we'll see why ecosystems are so powerful in creating growth and creating competitive advantages for the companies that, uh, that create them. So the potential of M2M and Internet of Things is clear. Nobody doubts it. Uh, every major telco lists M2M as a key strategic initiative. So that's, that's clear. The question remains how to do it, how to create that growth. And I want to start to answer this question by calling out some of the elephants in the room, by listing some key challenges that perhaps uh, go unspoken too often. The first is um, that analysts in this business expect uh, exponential growth. The talk is of tens of billions of devices or connections. So tens of billions is a huge number. Several times the world's population and it's several times the current mobile market or the current smartphone market in terms of devices or connections. Question remains, who will buy all those tens of billions devices? Why would they buy so many uh, devices and how to create this exponential growth? A second question has to do not so just with growth, but with profitability and shareholder value. How to create that? M2M is uh, hauled as uh, the new SMS as a, a replacement or uh, at least a partial replacement of the voice and SMS revenues for telcos that are currently under pressure. However, if you look at analyst predictions for this market, uh, it's predicted in the tens of billions of dollars as a, as a worth uh, for, uh, for telcos not in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars, which is the current voice and SMS revenue. We also see that the revenue per connection or per uh, user is quite low in comparison to SMS and voice, and there is no improvement in sight. On the contrary, these uh, revenues per user are still dropping. They're not rising. Finally, because uh, this is about connecting devices and because telcos uh, or in the connectivity business, it seems that telcos are in pole position. However, one could argue that they were in pole position also in 2008 before the smartphone market, and at that time they didn't manage to capitalize on that position. So the question is how to move beyond commoditized connectivity in a competitive environment where many, many players are entering the game and are trying to build M2M -M solutions. All of this together uh, looks like a very tough nut to crack. We have to acknowledge that. This is not an easy task to create this growth and to create this profitability. The projections uh, of the M2M -M market amount to very high expectations to live up to. We believe that these challenges can be solved by ecosystem economics. So let's see how that can, uh, how that can be done. Let's start with growth, right? The growth needed to reach those tens of billions of devices that some analysts predict. Obviously, this can only be achieved by targeting a large group of potential users who are not currently buying M2M solutions. If they were currently buying M2M solutions, then the growth would already be behind us, right? So these are non-consumers. The question is, why aren't they buying? Could be, could the reason for their non-consumption be that the current solutions are not very suitable for them? This is not just random or just early stage in the market, but the solutions are not very suitable to them. So we already see the first examples of Internet of Things solutions of connected devices that are not really driven by this traditional M2M industry that has been built over the last decades, that are doing things quite differently, and maybe because of it, uh, they are successful. So let me give you some examples of this. One of the early examples in the Internet of uh, Things was the Nest Learning Thermostat. It was developed by an ex a uh, designer for Apple, he was the head of uh, the iPhone and iPod design for several product generations, and he decided to leave Apple and to build a thermostat out of all things. It is a connected device, so it does belong in this category. And as the New York Times pointed out uh, around the time that this thermostat was launched, it introduced some uh, innovations. It had a very sleek, uh, nice-looking look. 
uh, it's learned um, uh, when you would uh, need more heat or less heat and it could sense um, the environment so it would for instance know when you had left the house and could adjust temperature accordingly. So if you look at the look and the learning and the sensing uh, it seems that this is all about convenience and about ease of use relative to existing thermostats. No more need for complex programming, you just adjust the temperature whenever you want uh, and the thermostat will learn for you how to, how to drive this system. It's also a seemingly clearer and simpler and more practical road to saving energy than for instance smart meters which are driven by utilities. The Nest thermostat was quite successful. Uh, Gigaom earlier this year uh, estimated that they're shipping now about 50,000 uh, units every month which would mean that uh, they're about 5% of all thermostat sales in the US. And this for a quite premium device which costs about 10 times a basic thermostat uh, and a premium device that was launched less than two years ago. So I would say that that is pretty successful. Let's look at another example. Uh, Smart Things is a home automation system that allows you to connect uh, different sensors and controls around your house uh, to a central hub which you can see on the screenshot here. And you can also download apps uh, to tie those sensors and controls together and to create some rules uh, that allow you to, to automate your home. Without going into the details of, of how this works or what it offers, uh, I'd like to point your attention to some aspects of their messaging. I say that this system is simple and elegant. It works right out of the box. You just tap, explore, install. Very simple. It's not just simplicity either. You can connect a lot of different things. And it's as easy as installing apps on your phone. So this system gives you a level of flexibility and personalization that dedicated solutions uh, might not give you. SmartThings obviously is much more early stage than the Nest thermostat, but it also has a track record of success. It was one of the most successful projects on the crowd, crowdfunding platform Kickstarter that thousands of back backers and over a million dollars uh, pledged to the solutions, which was about five times the goal they had set uh, for themselves. So I conclude from these two examples that doing more of the same, providing quote-unquote better solutions along the current criteria for M2M solutions, such as reliability or security, is not really going to help non-consumers uh, to buy more, uh, uh, more solutions. What these two examples have in common is that people who are potential buyers of M2 solutions but are not buying today, they seem to be doing so for a good reason. It's not because of the lack of performance of these solutions, it's rather because they're too complex or too expensive. So it follows then that um, simplicity and flexibility uh, are uh, better characteristics or, or better focus points uh, to create uh, M2M solutions for non-consumers today. We think that targeting non-consumers will grow not current existing customers but people who are not buying today will grow the M2M market into something much much bigger than what is conceived today. Here we hit our first snag though uh, which is probably best captured by the Shirky principle coined by American writer Clay Shirky. Uh, he said that institutions will try to preserve the problem to which they are the solution. So telcos and system integrators and their partners have created the current value chain around M2M that solves the problem for high-end M2M solutions, but not necessarily for very simple ones. Let's be clear, there is nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong with this value chain for high-end solutions. It's a very attractive market and it will be successful for a long time to come. It's just not very suitable to create solutions of the level of simplicity and the level of flexibility of the previous examples that we saw. To delight non-consumers with simple solutions and to grow the market to unprecedented levels, we therefore need to turn to other solution creators. Developers will, in our opinion, play a crucial role in the M2M ecosystem. The core benefit of using a large group of diverse developers rather than trying to think of solutions yourself or with a small amount of partners can be captured in this quote by investor and entrepreneur Sam Zell. He said that, listen, business is easy. If you've got a low downside and a big upside, you go do it. If you've got a big downside and a low upside, you run away. Very simple. So as we'll see, developers do exactly that for ecosystems. They provide a low downside and a big upside. 
Again, we can turn to an example, and, and let's take the fitness industry as an example. So fitness solutions are one small niche out of thousands of potential niches that together compose the Internet of Things market. But they're a considerable one. I mean, fitness spending in the U.S. is about $45 billion uh, per year today. And we already see connected devices, Internet of Things solutions for fitness today. Some very successful ones. So platforms like Fitbit or Strava or Nike Plus uh, provide uh, things like um, uh, bracelets that track your movement and, and help, you, um, uh, help you stay fit. They have been uh, invested in by tens of millions of uh, dollars and, and show really millions of users already. Other ones uh, look very promising. So you have uh, systems like Game Golf or Therability, which is a fitness appliance for uh, baby boom uh, uh, audience. Uh, golfers and baby boomers are off, obviously very affluent uh, target uh, markets, uh, so they look uh, pretty promising as devices. Others, in my opinion, just seem crazy. And so 9450 is uh, a sensor-enabled basketball that allows you to uh, to measure the arc of your shot or, or the amount of times that you have dribbled. So that, that looks like a bit of a crazy example. Note, though, that in all of these examples, um, the person who made it or the company that made them is not an M2M expert. They don't belong to this classical value chain of M2M, but they're third-party developers. And developers should be seen in a very broad uh, sense here. They're a very diverse group from Kickstarters and Tinkerers and startups to very large corporations like Nike. So the prevalence of third party when you look at any niche in, in, in terms of the solutions uh, shouldn't come really as a surprise. It's difficult for a, a telco or for a, a central player, uh, if not impossible, to get access to or knowledge about or even awareness of every single little uh, niche in this business especially if such a niece is, is not considered a core business. So does a telco talk on a regular basis with supporters as a specific target group? Most likely not. The reason that developers then are so well suited to find solutions for non-consumers in the context of an ecosystem is threefold. First of all, developers can discover needs that for telcos are either too risky or maybe too small of an opportunity to niche or maybe uh, catering to a need uh, for a group that they don't really have a good connection with. Developers can therefore uh, find apps that telcos cannot. Secondly, developers insulate uh, telcos uh, from failure. So some of these developers and some of these applications and solutions will fail. There is no guarantee, for instance, that this crazy basketball example will survive. It might or it might not. And that's actually okay. Some failure, having some failure, is not just unavoidable, it's actually desirable because it represents the kind of risk-taking behavior that is absolutely necessary to uncover unexpected opportunities. Only now, if you use third-party developers to create those solutions, the risk is not taken by a central player in the ecosystem or by a small group of companies, but by a very wide group of individual developers. The ecosystem and the ecosystem owner uh, are therefore shielded from failure, but they still benefit if one of these applications becomes successful. Thirdly, developers invest quite a lot of their time, their effort, their money in creating solutions. And this investment adds value to the ecosystem as a whole. We will see that this value added to the ecosystem will eventually multiply and can be harvested later by the ecosystem owner. So, by providing discovery of killer applications, of very successful applications, app develop or solution developers can create a very big upside for the ecosystem. And by offloading investment and risk of failure to developers, uh, they actually uh, also um, take care of a low downside for the ecosystem as a whole. So that seems like a good idea according to this quote from uh, Sam Zell. Now we are ready to put one and two together and to arrive at a full ecosystem. So if it is to gain exponential growth, developers and users must be free to interact with each other without the meddling of very skeptical gatekeepers. Uh, developers know how to cater to the diverse needs of non-consumers, at least as a group they do. So it's best to get out of the way and reduce friction for the interaction between developers and users as much as possible. 
Um, I want to paraphrase Jeff Bezos here, the CEO of Amazon. Uh, as he wrote in this letter to shareholders, he said, empowering others to unleash their creativity, to pursue their dreams, and to boldly experiment creates a very diverse group of improbable, but very often successful ideas. Gatekeepers that insist that that will never work will ultimately slow down innovation, even when they are very well-meaning experts in their field. So it's clear now to me that the current system of closed partnerships that forms the current M2M market is quite inefficient in doing exactly that, in allowing others to unleash their creativity and bring their experiments to users. The solution then is to create a platform that connects users with developers and with device makers and other stakeholders. How? Well, in the app economy, uh, this uh, connection was created by the App Store, by a marketplace where users and developers can interact. This is not the only possibility, but it could be a good start for M2M as well. The platform owner's role then is to provide the, the technology, the funding, the governance and the distribution channels that reduces friction in this communication or in this interaction between developers and users and thereby stimulate growth. This obviously goes way beyond just a limited partnership. It's much more self-service and free access for the participants into this uh, platform. Together, if you let loose these different stakeholders, they can uncover needs that no single organization or no limited partnership ever could. Now, the real magic happens when so-called network effects kick in. So that's when users come uh, to the ecosystem because of an uh, um, uh, because of an application that they liked, um, they provide a market for developers, so developers join in, they start creating more solutions, so that attracts more users, more users attract more developers, round and round it goes in a virtuous circle uh, of, uh, of network effects. So that is the true source of exponential growth. So now we can arrive at a formal definition for an ecosystem. It's not just a collection of partners or a supply chain or something like that. It's a business model that connects stakeholder groups together and enables them to interact efficiently. Ecosystems create wealth for their owners by driving the core business of their owners, while reducing friction for every, everybody else. So value is captured in the core business of the ecosystem owner. In this specific example, because it's not the only possible example of an M2M ecosystem, it would be telco subscriptions. Network effects also create strong lock-in, making this system, this ecosystem, almost impossible to compete with. In the app ecosystem, it's clear that um, the iOS and Android ecosystems currently form a duopoly, and it's very difficult to dislodge them. So all the nitty-gritty details of ecosystem economics are beyond the scope of this webinar. Uh, we explained more in the paper, um, but we can summarize it uh, as follows. Smart ecosystem players create value by connecting developers, users, and other stakeholders. And the role of the platform owner then is to reduce friction between all these stakeholders, to facilitate discovery of solutions and to ensure a certain quality of these solutions. And if they want to capture some of that wealth, to integrate the platform with their core business. So in conclusion, it's network effects that drive this exponential growth that we want, that create lock-in, and that makes an ecosystem almost impossible to directly compete with. They are the reason, network effects are the reason why ecosystems are so powerful, and why anybody who wants to win with an ecosystem needs to act right now. Network effects originate from addressing non-consumers, which form the fuel of this growth. They originate from using a large and diverse set of developers to address the needs of those non-consumers and then connecting them, those users and those developers, efficiently. If history is any guide, ecosystems will emerge, they'll probably emerge soon, and they will be the winning economic system uh, in the M2M market. It's already happening, actually. Some of the examples I mentioned, like the Nike Plus system or SmartThings, are opening up their system and allowing third-party developers to add value uh, to their uh, small, small ecosystems. We also know that once established, ecosystems are very difficult to dislodge uh, or to compete with. And um, once you participate in an ecosystem that you don't own, we also know that it's very difficult to actually extract wealth for yourself. So the ecosystem owner has a unique opportunity to design this platform to his own advantage. And why can it not be a telco? 
Vision Mobile uh, offers uh, support if you want to take the route of, of ecosystems. Uh, we have uh, papers where you can read more information about this. We organize workshops like the Mobile Innovation Economics Workshop uh, specifically about this topic. We give training, we do consulting. Basically, we can help you to see opportunities using ecosystems that most others will miss. We can help you to promote these ideas within your organization, to gather support for them. We can help you to gather resources and to make the business case for your CFO. And finally, to give you the knowledge to deploy these resources effectively in creating an ecosystem. So with this, I thank you for your attention and will now open the floor for questions. Thank you, Sam. That was very interesting. So uh, before we get to our uh, audience's questions, uh, I have one of my own. So. Uh, is this uh, applicable to other companies beyond telcos? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we take a telco approach as a kind of a case study for this, but ecosystem principles, the, the economics behind ecosystems, are pretty well-known principles that are open to all. And we've already seen ecosystems applied very successfully in very diverse industries in the past, uh, ranging from uh, retailers like uh, like Walmart or Amazon to electronics uh, to even very ancient industries like uh, like the shipping industry. Thank you, Sam. So uh, let's go to some of the questions from the audience. Who do you see as the main competitors to the operators for the position as ecosystem owners? So we can already see uh, companies entering the game from several different uh, directions. So some of the competitors might uh, uh, include domain-specific companies. Uh, we mentioned Nike uh, as a domain-specific company in sports. Other examples might be Ford in automotive or uh, GE, General Electric in the industrial world. Um, but basically any ecosystem participant potentially could be an ecosystem owner. So this can include device makers. Uh, we know that ARM has an, uh, a platform for M2M -M devices uh, called Embed. Uh, it might be cloud services or, or companies from IT or from the internet space. So anything from IBM as a very large company to SmartThings, the, the example that we mentioned. It might be device management platforms. So we, so, uh, there, we know that there is a, an alliance around the Jasper uh, wireless system, um, they might uh, become a competitor. Or even tool makers, we know that uh, Eclipse, uh, which is uh, um, uh, basically in a development environment, is, is entering the M2M -M game as well. Probably the, the traditional ecosystem owners in uh, smartphones, uh, like uh, Google or Apple, um, will not be the ones to actually create the M2M -M ecosystem, but there are plenty of other uh, candidates out there. Another interesting question uh, posed by someone is as follows. So smartphone apps are universal. Carrier apps for M2M would be local. Do you see carriers becoming M2M service providers outside their physical network markets? Well, I think that uh, telcos have a unique opportunity here to do exactly that. Uh, there is no reason why telcos would build an ecosystem and then limit it to their geographical uh, footprint uh, of their own network. Um, there's only one thing I would caution for, um, because I see, I see a, a lot of alliances in the M2M space uh, where basically telcos put themselves in a position where they're competing with each other in the same kind of geographies for the same kind of business. Uh, that seems to me to be a recipe to commoditize themselves and, and not really to become um, a big uh, ecosystem, uh, ecosystem player. So that's something that we point out also in the paper to pay attention to. Uh, but there's no reason why an ecosystem designed by a telco could not be applicable far beyond the geographic limits of, uh, of their network. Thank you, Sam. Uh, another question is, uh, what about telcos uh, taking the M2M ecosystem route? So are there any? Are there any success stories? Uh, 
So we haven't seen a full ecosystem effort from any uh, telecom operator, uh, but we've seen several ones that uh, have implemented some aspects or some parts of it and that might be uh, on the route to creating an, an M2M ecosystem. So some examples I can mention here is AT&T. They have their Digital Life initiative, which is kind of like a marketplace for M2M solutions for consumers. Um, they focus a lot on quality control and, and on, on uh, providing very good solutions for their users, which is a good thing, but they're not open to developers, so they, they are unlikely to reap the benefits of any network effects. Uh, we also saw Deutsche Telekom opening an M2M marketplace, but with a quite limited uh, B2B oriented audience for now. Uh, another example I might mention is uh, this alliance around uh, the Jasper wireless uh, system, which for now is only a technology platform, so it, it doesn't quite connect users and developers together in the way that we've, uh, we've just described. So we've seen uh, parts of it being implemented, but not a full effort uh, just yet. Okay, we have uh, a long question here. Let me just try to read it. Uh, do you think this approach also applies to companies where the target mar market is not the consumer market? So this person saying that their customers are usually machine builders integrating devices into their machines. They have a big hype on M2M technologies, but as you mentioned right in the beginning, the traditional approach appears to make the, prod the product harder to use, not easier. So I think this is the B2C versus B2B question, and obviously the examples uh, in the presentation today were more B2C oriented, um, but it's not a, a quite a sharp distinction between uh, business oriented or uh, consumer oriented solutions. It's actually quite a, a spectrum, a continuous spectrum of, uh, of solutions. So probably if you look at very engineering driven solutions where the customer is, is, an, is an engineer or an engineering organization, um, it might be more difficult uh, to provide um, an ecosystem solution. Uh, however, anything below that, so going from very large enterprises that are not engineering oriented to uh, the SME markets uh, to consumers, uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a wide open market there for both business-oriented solutions, but not engineering-oriented, and consumer solutions to apply this ecosystem to. So it's by no means just limited to a B2C market. Uh, you should see this on a spectrum, and most of this spectrum can be addressed by an ecosystem strategy. Uh, here's another one. Can telcos compete with over-the-top OTT players using ecosystems in M2M? So I'm, I'm not sure I, I get that question exactly, but uh, if you mean whether telcos can use the same ecosystem techniques uh, than OTT players, then the answer is yes. Nothing, absolutely nothing prevents them from doing so. If telcos, however, find themselves in an ecosystem that is driven by over-the-top players or by anybody else than telcos, they're actually quite likely to get commoditized. And this is exactly what we saw in the smartphone and, and app ecosystem. It's not impossible to avoid commoditization in such a scenario, but it's just quite difficult. Um, there are some operators who even explicitly are preparing for, uh, for this kind of scenario. So one example here might be Net1. It's an operator from Sweden who is explicitly choosing an efficient uh, bit pipe strategy. And that might actually be a very viable and, and good strategy to choose. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but there is this danger that uh, participating in an ecosystem that you don't own is, is not really a good starting position. Uh, in order to drive profitable growth and in order to drive uh, competitive advantages. Okay, I think we have uh, time for uh, one more question. Uh, so, uh, the growth argument is clear, but how can telcos capture value from this ecosystem? So that's actually a quite, uh, quite complex question, um, which I don't think we have time to, to go in all the details. Uh, our, uh, our M2M paper and actually our Telco Innovation Toolbox paper as well uh, go much deeper uh, in this subject. Um, the trick though is to design the platform in such a way that it drives your core business. 
Um, so in the case, let's 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 take an example. Maybe I have a, a slide here as well. Uh, can I show that? Okay. So let's take the example of uh, the iOS platform in, in this case. Uh, so the the Apple uh, iPhone platform. Um, this platform is quite open to developers, so developers are free to submit uh, apps to the App Store. Um, there is some quality control and some vetting process there, but basically they're free to create applications. However, Apple remains very closed around the product experience and around their devices, and that's where actually they get all their money for. So in the case of iOS, the ecosystem is designed in such a way that it's accessible for users and, and for developers, but it is closed in such a way that Apple uh, can extract value by selling premium devices. Um, this is the way to, to design an, an ecosystem in order to extract uh, value for it. So I might not be explaining that very well, so uh, uh, please uh, feel free to read our, our papers or ask us more questions afterwards. I'll be happy to explain this in much more detail. Okay, thank you, Stain. I think this is all the time we have. Uh, for any of you who uh, didn't get a response to your question, we'll be responding via email. Thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure having you here. I hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar. Two reminders, so uh, please download the M2M ecosystem recipe report for uh, more details on uh, this emerging market. You can find it for uh, free at visionmobile.com slash m2m. And also, if you have any questions uh, or any uh, feedback for us, please get in touch uh, with me at matos at visionmobile.com. So that's matos, M-A-T-O-S. So thanks for joining us, and uh, see you next time. Goodbye.